So this is Kirti Shen's webinar with Edgewise Therapeutics. Um, we'll be talking about their novel approach to protect muscle and Duchenne and Bucker muscular dystrophy today. So this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will put this on our website for you to view, um, review, or share with others. You can submit questions throughout this webinar. So there's going to be a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you submit questions throughout the webinar whenever something comes to mind. We're going to answer those all at the end at about the last uh, 15 minutes of this hour today. And then if you have additional kind of questions or inquiries about anything talked about today, about Cure Duchenne, about Edgewise, please email those to cares at curedushen.org and we'll make sure that we get your question answered. And then before we jump in today, I wanted to remind everyone that the registration for our national conference is open. We're so excited. It's in San Diego this year, April 21st through 23rd. Um, you can find more information at curedushen.org slash futures. Um, last year, we had such a blast and we learned so much. So we hope that you'll join us um, next. I am going to welcome the Edgewise team onto the webinar today. Wonderful. There we are. Oh. All right. We have Alan Russell, Abby Bronson, and Joanne Donovan. I will let them introduce themselves, um, and then Abby will take it from there. So, Alan, why don't you um, begin? Uh, good morning. I am Alan Russell. I am the Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of Edgewise Therapeutics. Uh, so, I'm the science guy, and I, uh, I will tell you a little bit about um, the mechanism of the compound. Uh, before Joanne talks. It's great to meet you. Thanks, Alan. Joanne? Hi, I'm Joanne Donovan. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Edgewise, and really pleased to speak with you today. I'm going to share uh, information on uh, what we've done in the clinic uh, on EDG 5506, why we think it's promising, and what we are planning to do in the future in terms of clinical trials right now and, in, and um, uh, coming up. So Thanks, happy to Joanne. chat. And Abby, go ahead, Abby, as you introduce yourself, I'll mute myself and turn off my camera to turn it over to you and just let me know when you'd like to go to the next slide. Okay, thanks. First of all, I, uh, I'm Abby Bronson. I'm the VP of Patient Advocacy at Edgewise Therapeutics. Um, and I just first want to thank Cure Duchenne for giving us this opportunity to talk about our company and what we're trying to do and, uh, you know, just serve as the, 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 the bridge between us and the companies and the community. So thanks very much. You can go to the next slide. So this is our forward-looking statement. We are a publicly traded company, so we have to... Uh, put all kinds of caveats up on the slide, but probably the most important thing to know is that EDGE 5506 or EDG 5506, like both, both uh, terms refer to the same compound. Um, it's an investigational agent and it's not approved anywhere. You can go to the next slide. Um, again, the agenda, I think probably Alan and Joanne kind of gave a little bit of a preview, but I'm going to start with an inter introduction to EDGEWISE. Um, and talk a little bit about patient advocacy and what I do. Um, and then Alan's going to take you through some of the science and the mechanism of action or a, a fancy way of saying what, how is this compound supposed to work? And then Joanne, Joanne will talk about our clinical development program. Okay, next slide. So Edgewise was founded in 2017. We're based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and our vision is to improve the lives of patients and families suffering from rare muscle disorders. That includes muscular dystrophy and definitely includes Becker and Duchenne, which is where we're starting. That's how, what we're focusing on first. Um, our approach is novel and potentially complementary to the current approaches that are out there. And you'll hear a little bit more about why it's novel, meaning it's first in class. No one's ever done this before. Um, and we were really focused on trying to make what we are developing um, convenient and easy to use. So you can go to the next slide. So before I turn it over to Alan, and he's going to talk a little bit about the science, I wanted to take a moment to talk about um, patient advocacy at Edgewise. And truly, patients are at the core of everything to do, uh, everything we do, and we're we really are better when we listen to you. 
So when I think about what I do at Edgewise, I kind of divide it into two buckets. And the first part is where we're listening to you. So when we go out and we do focus groups and we do community advisory boards, we're taking all the information that you provide to us and we're integrating those into our clinical trial design, trying to reduce the burden for you to participate in the clinical trial and also really trying to develop very meaningful um, out points. Like what are we studying? What's a meaningful clinical benefit? So that's one of the aspects of what I do. And then we also take that information and really helps establish what we call the therapeutic context for risk benefit decision making. And really what that means is that, you know, companies, sponsors do clinical trials. We collect a lot of data on efficacy and safety. We take that to the regulators and then they have to make a decision. But it's very hard to make a decision unless you understand that therapeutic context or what it's like to live with the disease, what is the unmet burden, what is, um, what's the symptom. So that's the kind of information that's also very, very helpful for us. And that's a lot of what I focus on. And then the last three bullets, the second bucket of what I consider that um, patient advocacy does is that you know we're trying to become a trusted partner in the whole community because it really takes a community to develop these drugs and accelerate these clinical trials. So we work with all the advocacy organizations to understand the community needs and move those forward as we can. We're working with the clinical and research ecosystem to push forward better treatments. And we're trying to, um, you know, obviously we help with disease awareness and education. Um, so that's a little bit of what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to take a moment to talk about that before I turn it over to Alan and he's gonna take you on a deep dive into the science behind what we do. Alan? Thank you so much, Abby. Uh, so if you go on to the next slide, um, I'm going to tell you a brief story about 5506 and why it makes a difference, we hope, in the context of Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy. And I say Duchenne and Becker because we have a what I call a kind of structural fix for the muscle. This is not a genetic fix. So it doesn't really matter what your genetics are that you come in through the door with. Uh, 5506 uh, should hopefully protect your muscles. Um, so some muscle fibers are more susceptible to damage than others. Sometimes we refer to these as fast and slow fibers. I'm only going to delve into that very briefly, but we're designed to protect your most susceptible muscle fibers. It makes up about half of our bodies. We've made 5506. It's a small molecule, so it's a standard medicine in a pill once a day uh, to protect these susceptible muscle fibers from damage, regardless of mutation, as I said. So we're, we're really trying to uncouple the ability of muscle to injure itself. And I will show some uh, kind of nice pictures in that. And then we've done a lot of preclinical work in different types of um, muscular dystrophy models, primarily Duchenne in mice and dogs. I'll show you a little bit of data, but in all of those models, we see this consistent effect of 5506 to protect the muscle uh, and improve long-term outcomes. Next slide. So on the left-hand side is a standard picture of dystrophin and where it is in the muscle, but I'm gonna show you something different, which is how it works when muscle is contracting, okay? So if you look on the right-hand side, those green stripes, they contain the dystrophin protein. And you can see that they're connecting all of those fibers together. And this is how we like to think of muscle contracting as one big block, but that's actually not generally what happens. Fibers are actually individually contracting and so what I'm showing here is a scenario where the central fiber is the only one contracting. And you can see how those green stripes actually connect the fibers and help the contraction of that central fiber be supported. Now, of course, if you don't have dystrophin or if it's mutated, the body tries to upregulate things to make do with a lack of dystrophin. But at the end of the day, now what's happening is these fibers are contracting on their own. There's no support from the surrounding fibers. So when that central fiber contracts, it's all on its own. And that leads to a higher incidence of stress. And when stress happens, the membrane gets upset. And that actually causes even further hypercontraction of those muscle fibers. That leads to further stress. And then what happens eventually is the fiber gets snipped up. It's kind of what happens in you and I. Uh, if you don't have Duchenne or Becker, um, and we do a bit too much exercise, Right? This is just the body's way 
of pruning out a muscle fiber that it feels is not working as best as it can. And the, the goal then, of course, will be to grow a new fiber, right? That leads to inflammation. And then that inflammation eventually leads to the fibrosis that causes the functional loss uh, with time in both Becker and Duchenne. Next slide. You can go to the next one. This was just in case my video failed. So I'm going to show you now the same thing, but now in live muscle. Now this is muscle from the MDX mouse. So the, dis the dystrophic Duchenne mouse. On the left-hand side is our control muscle. So that's a muscle contracting in a dish. It hasn't had a treatment. On the right-hand side, this muscle has been treated for one hour with 5506, our clinical candidate. On the left-hand side, what you can see is a version of the video I just showed you. As this muscle is contracting, you can see it's kind of moving around a lot. And that's because the membrane is becoming upset and that's causing further contraction of that muscle and snipping up of the fibers. And they're essentially kind of contracting down to a little blob that will then be disposed of to enable you to grow a new muscle fiber. If you have Duchenne, about 30% of your muscle, so a third of your muscle is turning over at any one time. And you can imagine that creates a huge load on inflammation. On the right-hand side, this muscle has been treated for one hour with 5506. And what 5506 does, it targets a protein in muscle called myosin, and it, it changes how the muscle contracts so that, it, so that the contraction doesn't now lead to the stress. So while we haven't done anything genetically to this muscle fiber, what we've done is we've essentially corrected that connection between contraction and breakdown. So this fiber, this muscle is now contracting pretty much as it should be because we've applied this molecular fix to stabilize those muscle fibers individually. Next slide. Now, um, when muscle fibers contract and get upset, they often leak proteins. And, and many of you I'm sure are familiar with creatine kinase. Quite often it's the first uh, signal um, upon for diagnosis of Duchenne, for instance. So along with creatine kinase, a number of other muscle proteins also leak out when fibers are upset. And I've given you four examples here, well, three and one general one. So we've got creatine kinase, We've got a thing called myoglobin. It's another muscle protein. We've got a thing called fast troponin, which we, which we really like that biomarker because it actually speaks to the fast fibers that we're protecting. It's a unique protein to those fibers. All of these leak out when muscle is upset and you can measure them in circulation and it gives you an idea of how upset your muscles are. Uh, and we've used that quite a lot in the clinical studies uh, and the preclinical studies that I'll tell you about. And then Joanne will give you a little bit more color on. So the, the core concept here is if we're stabilizing muscle, it shouldn't leak as much, okay? Next slide. Now, um, what, what I'm showing you here is how those proteins relate to different conditions. So you have control, so that's just healthy volunteers. Becker, so that's a, a cross-section of Becker people from a, uh, from a biobank. So these are from very young to very old. And you can see you've got an intermediary level of creatine kinase there. And then Duchenne on the right-hand side, this is again, young to old. This is the average creatine kinase. And you can see that's elevated compared to Becker. So you have this kind of stepwise function, Duchenne to Becker to healthy. That's the same for fast troponin. And the two generally go together. So if CK is high, fast troponin is high. Uh, I'm going to start by just telling you one uh, little story in a preclinical model, and then I'll pass it over to Joanne, who's going to tell you about people, which is, of course, really our major goal. So what, what you're looking at here is the, the uh, golden retriever with muscular dystrophy. This is kind of the largest mammal with muscular dystrophy that people tend to use for uh, clinical trials preclinical trials. And we did short-term dosing studies in these golden retrievers just to see what would happen to CK. And then in a secondary study, we actually looked at what happened to activity. So just focus on the left-hand side to start off with. Um, in this two-week intervention, we gave the, the, we gave the compound orally every day, once a day. And then we measured uh, CK every two to three days. And what you're looking at there is the average 
of all of those blood measures. And you can see at baseline, CK was higher. And then when we gave the 5506, it went down about 60% or so. So a nice decrease in CK. Uh, and then when we actually took the compound away, the CK bounced back up again. We actually heard from the, the vet techs when we were doing this, that the dogs appeared more active. So we actually used a collar bound activity monitor in the second study and measured how active the dogs were. And we saw the opposite result. So in the baseline, they were less active. And then when we gave 5506, their activity increased. So a really nice disconnect, if you like, between the ability of muscle to be active, dogs are more active, and yet their CK is lower. So you've corrected that ability for the muscle to injure itself. Next slide. So I'll now pass it over to Joanne and she'll, she'll piece these pieces together uh, and tell you a little clinical story. Yes, so we are talking about both Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I know that some of you are out there probably uh, with Duchenne saying, why are we talking about Becker and, and vice versa? And so that was my Boston accent coming through, I realize, <laughs> and the versa. Um, but the reason is that these are really all along the same spectrum of disease. So that in Duchenne, as you know, dystrophin is essentially completely missing um, and from, from birth onward. In Becker, there is some dystrophin, but it doesn't work well. And so that's why the um, basic problem for both of these is that the, the, when you have muscle contraction, it damages the muscle. More in Duchenne, less in Becker. And so both of them though, have that same problem that you saw with the video that Alan showed you that there is damage with contraction. So if we can address that, we see that this drug, EDG5506, could be useful across that spectrum. Now that's even getting blurred more because as dystrophin-targeted therapies are going into the clinic, they are providing some dystrophin. So the idea is actually to move Duchenne towards Becker. And so again, it goes to the continuum of these diseases. And that's why we can get information from Becker that applies to Duchenne and vice versa. So how do we think about this? The next slide um, is kind of how we think about it in terms of the clinical development program. And we started out in uh, unaffected adults. We also included in the phase one study. Now the phase one is the very first study that is where people are exposed to a drug. And there's some basic things that you wanna understand there. You wanna understand about safety. And we saw that um, the drug was well tolerated, both when we gave a single dose of it at different dose levels, or when we gave it for two weeks with very close observation. And we saw that EDG5506 was well tolerated. The most common side effects were dizziness and drowsiness. They both tended to happen in the first few days and then tended to disappear. So it hasn't uh, been a big issue um, in, when folks are, are dosed for longer periods of time. We also do measurements to see how the drug is absorbed. And we found that EDG5506 can be taken as an oral tablet once a day. It's absorbed well, and it's also absorbed with or without food. So that makes it convenient to take. We asked, does it get to the muscle? That's a huge thing in developing a drug. Is it getting to where it needs to be to act? And what we did to, it was to do muscle biopsies. We included uh, not only unaffected adults, but we also enrolled seven patients with Becker muscular dystrophy. They all get a gold star because they came to this phase one unit where they're kind of, uh, it, it's not great digs, it's not like a hotel. 
And they got poked and prodded for, for two weeks um, to understand really in great depth, is the drug safe? Is the drug, how is it, is it um, absorbed? And importantly, is it getting to muscle? So both in the unaffected adults and in the patients with Becker, we saw that the drug is highly concentrated in muscle. It's a, in the unaffected adults, there was a hundred times more drug in muscle than there was in the bloodstream. So that tells us it's getting to where it needs to be to protect the muscle. So on the next slide, we also looked at biomarkers. And this is actually bridging to uh, a longer term study where the folks that were in the phase one study with Becker um, then came back for a study where they uh, are getting the drug for up to a year, and we anticipate extending that longer. And we looked at those biomarkers that tell us about muscle damage. And that's what Alan uh, showed you. We saw those go down in the animals. Um, and so now we're looking to see whether or not we see the same kind of signal that we are protecting the muscle from the damage from contraction that happens just everyday activity. And so these guys are out doing what they would normally do um, in their daily lives. And we saw their CK go down 40% and it stayed down out to six months. And that's the last time that we've, we've checked it so far in everybody. And also another marker, it's called TNNI2. It's very specific for these kind of muscle fibers that we are protecting, we believe, with EDG 5506. And that was down 75%. So these are, are statistically significant. They're very encouraging because what we think is that if we can protect the muscle from contraction-induced damage, that then will translate into benefit in terms of function and preserving muscle function long-term, which we know is important to you. So on the next slide, we started to look also, we've looked at things like the North Star Ambulatory Assessment. That's something that it gets commonly done in clinic. It's really commonly done in clinically tr clinical trials. And what we saw when you look up and down is the change in North Star NSAA over the six month period. What we would expect in Becker and in these, in these patients is that it would tend to go down and that's that black line. Um, and we know this from natural history data. You know, there's a huge amount of natural history data in Duchenne, there's somewhat less in, in Becker muscular dystrophy, but it's still enough to tell us that these patients would have been going down and we're starting to see them go, go up um, over this time period. Um, there's, we also are looking at other measures and in, one is called the North Star Assessment of Limb Girdle Type Muscular Dystrophies. It's used in other adult muscular dystrophies. And we also see that improving. We don't have natural history data. But it's, it's, what it's telling us is that things are looking positive. This needs to be followed up in additional studies that I'll tell you about, but it's very encouraging to see the markers, the biomarkers go down and things trending in the right direction. So on the next slide, um, what are we doing? What are we trying to find out at this point and across both Becker and Duchenne? So the study that I um, told you about is ongoing uh, and that includes 12 adults with Becker who some of whom were in the phase one study. We're also enrolling at multiple sites across the United States and soon in the UK and the Netherlands. Uh, we're also enrolling a study in ambulatory adolescent and adult uh, men with Becker, uh, age 12 and up that is. Uh, and uh, on clintrials.gov, it tells you, there's the NCT number, it tells you where those sites are um, that are enrolling. Um, and we're also uh, starting a study we just announced last week, the first site is open um, in ambulatory boys um, with Duchenne. And so when we sent this in, it was planned to start and this shows you we're making progress, 
Uh, we just announced um, the first site is open. So let me tell you a little bit more about that, um, the trial in Duchenne on the next slide. So this trial is planned to be a year long study. It's a two part study. And the main objective of this study is since we're looking in boys for the first time to study the safety of EDG 5506. And there's two parts to the study. One is we're looking at biomarkers and then we're also looking at safety over the longer term, the one year. And the goal is to identify doses of EDG 5506 for a phase three study that had the potential to best reduce muscle, muscle damage. Because we have this early signal from biomarkers, we can get a lot of information early on. And that's, that's really helpful in, in designing the right clinical study. So that's what we are looking for in this study. This study is gonna enroll boys age four to nine up to their 10th birthday. And they need to have a genetic diagnosis of Duchenne. Um, they need to be ambulatory. And there are certain functional criteria um, that the uh, site, the investigator would test. Um, the boys uh, would need to be on a stable dose of corticosteroids. That means at least six months. And they may be on a stable dose of an exon skipping therapy already, if that they've been on that for a year. We'll be looking for about 27 uh, boys that will enroll across the United States. And um, they um, soon will already be enrolling. And it, it, but generally, this is spread out a bit. So er, all of the sites won't be immediately available. So some of them it will, it will take till early 2023 to get up and running. So the design of the study on the next slide, as I mentioned, there's two parts of it. One is a placebo control part. That's the three month period. Um, the boys, when they're screened into the study and enrolled, they'll get randomized, like a flip of the coin, to th one of three doses um, and to placebo versus active uh, treatment versus the drug. And so we'll look at, at uh, over three months at safety, at how the drug is absorbed and biomarkers. And then we'll follow the boys for an additional nine months, so a one year total um, uh, period of the study and uh, understand also in terms of functional measures, how they are, are doing. So what happens during the trial huh? on the next slide? There are about 10 visits. They're spaced out through the trial. As when it, we look for the first time we need to look more closely. We need to keep a close eye on them. And that's just to be cautious. So this, the visits tend to be more in the beginning and towards the end of the trial, we get to space them out to every two or three months. Um, we have tried uh, as much as we can to incorporate things that we can get information at home um, for the routine monitoring, being things like video or telephone visits. Um, we are not including a muscle biopsy uh, in the study. Uh, of course, they will have blood tests, functional assessments when they're at the clinic. Um, we'll be looking at the heart with a cardiac echo. We'll be looking with a DEXA at things like bone density and muscle mass, and also lung function tests um, that um, the boys will typically have had uh, before in the clinic. The functional tests are things like the North Star ambulatory assessment, four stair climb, 100 meter uh, timed uh, walk test, and strength testing. So kind of the typical things that we include uh, in a study. And on the next slide, highlight some of the at-home measures. This is something you probably haven't seen before, the TASO M20. And it's a device that, may, that can collect a very small amount of, blo of blood. It's, it's like, um, it's a very uh, small needle. And that device that you see with the red uh, button is 
um, put on the arm. They said a little adhesive. It's like a Band-Aid adhesive to stick it onto the arm. And um, the caregiver pushes the red button and a very narrow gauge, very small needle um, the, uh, draws a small amount of blood. It's only enough to, uh, basically it's blood spots. It's very um, a small amount of blood. And that allows us to look uh, at the amount of, of the drug in the bloodstream and monitor that more closely than we could. And, and we don't wanna make people come into the clinic as frequently uh, for that. Um, the reason that it's on the arm rather than finger sticks um, is that the arm has less is less sensitive. And so we've tried it ourselves and it, it barely, you can barely feel it. Um, it is, it looks a little bit big, but it is, um, it is, is uh, pretty easy to use um, and can be used in, in small uh, children as well. So that's something that we're using for the first time in this study. And it really has the potential to, to reduce the number of visits and yet be able to, to collect the information that we need. We'll also be using the side device. Uh, I'll go back a slide. And that's an activity monitor. Um, these have developed over the years. This is about the size of an Apple Watch. Um, and, and so the boys hopefully can look cool with their Apple Watch. And it measures um, how many steps they take and how fast they are walking. So it really gives an integrated assessment of, of um, activity and the effect of the drug on activity. You know, there's always been this, you know, well, why are we measuring things with something that takes 10 seconds or even 15 minutes at clinic? And this gives us a more integrated view of what the drug, what effect the drug is having. You know, Alan mentioned to you in the, in the, the dogs, um, we were able to see an increase in activity uh, in the dogs. So we are, are, are looking at that. Um, it's it's a, a more established now uh, measure in clinical trials. We're excited to be using that and getting uh, information uh, from the real world, basically. So um, on the next slide, um, we are thinking about how we are going to design trials in the future. Uh, how are we going to look to other age ranges, to older uh, boys, to non-ambulatory um, adolescents and uh, young men, um, and also to younger age groups. So that's something that we are uh, actively considering how, what the best way of doing that in terms of the, the endpoints that we use and, and how to do that. The TASO is gonna be helpful there as well. Um, we are looking uh, to expand uh, as we move to phase, phase three in Duchenne um, and can also use these home-based uh, measures. Um, we see this as not just a drug by itself, but also very much um, going to uh, integrate with the standard of care. So as dystrophin targeted therapies uh, move along, we see this as as an adjunct. This is really a, a different approach um, and can be used um, uh, alone or in combination with other therapies uh, as they uh, become available. So to, to summarize um, on the next slide, as Abby said at the beginning, we are um, really trying to engage with the community to understand the trial burden, to fix that as much as we can. We know we can't make it go away altogether, but we wanna decrease the barriers as much as we can. Um, we do provide concierge services um, for, to support travel, to prepay expenses, so there, there isn't things out of pocket and other resources to ease the burden on families um, and to make the, the, the visits uh, less intense um, as well uh, to, uh, uh, for routine monitoring. So to summarize, we are looking to develop EDG 5506 for Becker and Duchenne um, and to um, have a, an oral drug to preserve and improve function um, in, in both of these uh, diseases in patients with every any mutation, because you know the muscle has a opportunity to regenerate if we can prevent that damage 
can preserve it and allow it to, to regenerate. We're preventing damage by preventing, protecting the most susceptible uh, muscle fibers, uh, using it potentially alone or in combination with other therapeutic approaches, and really going to the, to the fundamental issue of, of muscle uh, contraction-induced damage. Um, it's what dystrophin is supposed to be there to prevent, and if we can basically go to this very fundamental problem uh, in uh, Duchenne and Becker. So um, on the last slide, just like to thank you. There's our contact information. Uh, if uh, you have questions that you think of next week, let us know. And I bet there's a lot of questions out there now. Um, and I guess we can move to that uh, with uh, Dr. Mike Kelly. Joanne, thank you. A uh, super presentation from each of you guys. And I think it went over really well, given the number of questions that we've had already, you know, sent in from people. I'm going to pick a few really just to discuss and try and expand on a couple of topics here. And, you know, in the order that we were talking, I'll give the first one over to Alan, really to try and expand upon the mechanism of action here. You know, the questioner really picks up on a couple of points. One is reduction in muscle force are changing the way that muscles react. And the questioner really just wanted a little bit more color around what that actually means for the way this molecule works. Yeah, I saw that question. It's a real good one, right? Because mm -hmm. it's really- We can tell why I went to that one first. Yes, like absolutely. Because it's key, it's key. Like, how's this thing working? You're showing me this like, oh, it's falling apart. It's not falling apart. Oh my gosh. So, um, this is a really early concept for me, you know, that there's this one-to-one -one connection between muscles contracting and muscles getting injured, right? If you have Duchenne or Becker. And I showed you that video where you have that one fiber in the center contracting and it's now no longer supported by its friends, right? In a way, what 5506 is doing is providing that support. And what it does is it actually, by targeting myosin and the contraction of muscle, what it actually does is it provides a speed limiter for an individual muscle fiber. So that fiber contracting in the center actually now has a speed limiter on it. So it can only contract up to a certain point. And what that actually causes is more muscle fibers to be recruited into the contraction process. So instead of that fiber being on its own, it now has a speed limiter. It can only go at 60 miles an hour and not 100 miles an hour. That causes you to use more muscle fibers, also contracting at 60 miles an hour. And that overall allows your muscles to work without injuring themselves. So, you know, I think if you've got a kid with Duchenne, quite often you have these, you have, you have these um, questions about exercise. Well, I know my kid needs exercise to be healthy, but I know if he exercises, he's going to injure his muscle, right? In many ways, what we're doing is we're changing that program. Right. So now you can exercise and the muscle doesn't fall apart. You actually spread the load across more fibers by using this mechanism. Right. And by doing that, you protect the muscle. It's a really fundamental way of thinking about muscular dystrophy. It's a completely different strategy. I know it's complicated, but actually, I, I do believe it's going to make a huge difference to muscle breakdown in Duchenne and Becker. Yeah, it's exactly the reason I wanted to address that one first, because it is such a unique and different mechanism from all the other approaches out there. And I think it's certainly caught the imagination of scientists. And the, the task that we have is to explain to parents why this is really an interesting approach. So thank you for that there, Alan. Um, oh, well, thank you, Mike, because I know, I know people come up to you quite often and you help us out, right? Thanks. So thanks very much. Oh, you're most welcome. So continuing with the same theme here, because I think it's important to make sure that parents really understand this. Um, you mentioned skeletal muscle a lot. And is this, this um, reduction in force protection of muscle seen across all muscle groups? Do we expect this in the heart, for example? Right. So this, the, the compound is specifically designed to not affect the heart directly, right? Because I was full aware, if you make a, a, a compound that affects the heart, well, then you're going to have all heart effects and no skeletal muscle effects. I want it to primarily affect the skeletal muscle. It's the biggest muscle in the body. But then that, of course, raises important questions. Well, if you're not directly affecting the heart, is that, is that still going to run down, right? Are we going to have problems with the heart? Now, we don't directly target the heart, but certainly in preclinical models, 
we did some studies in a mouse model called the DBA2J MDX. It's fancy names for a more severe version of, uh, of a dystrophic mouse, um, a Duchenne mouse. They get real nasty uh, cardiac fibrosis. They get a lot of protein in the heart, which isn't helping. And what we saw in those studies, we saw an improvement in that. Now you're saying, well, why would that be, right? But you go imagine that skeletal muscle is everywhere. It's in the diaphragm, it's in the intercostal muscles, it's in all of your limb muscles. And when, you, when your muscles are breaking down, that creates a lot of inflammation and problems that then load onto the heart. So there's a, there's a primary problem with the heart, it doesn't have dystrophin, but I think a big component of the heart problems are all of your skeletal muscles having an issue. So what we hope is that by stabilizing the skeletal muscles, we at least give the heart a better table to work on. Okay, we'll be monitoring cardiac safety and all of the rest of it, of course, uh, and hopefully uh, my prediction will come true. We'll see. Okay, uh, and one final one, Alan. It was a, again another question, and it's really related to the way the molecule was designed in the specific and selective for myosin. Do you expect off mechanism side effects? And the one that yeah. The, the questioner was asking about was the type of bone toxicity that one sees with steroids or kidney effects. You know, I'm full aware that you guys in the community have to put up with a lot of um, bad stuff that all these medicines that we're making uh, do, right? Um, one of the nice things that I can say about 5506 is that the worst things that we've seen, as Joanne documented, uh, is the dizziness and drowsiness when you first go on the medicine. And that seems to abate after a couple of days. And of course, this is a medicine you take for, you know, forever. So it's, it's, it's a minor inconvenience for some people. Uh, for most people, they don't even see that. And then after that, we've seen very little of anything. No kidney, no liver type stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we're going to keep monitoring these things as we go forwards. But some of the Becker guys have been on the compound for six months plus at this point uh, with, with no... Uh, ill effects. So we, we feel pretty good about that. And that also includes people with very low function. Uh, so some, some guys who really aren't that ambulatory at all, they're using assistive devices. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, Joanne, just switching gears for a second. I, I was delighted to see that the inclusion criteria allowed for patients that were on exon skipping drugs that were approved. Um, could you give some comment out there to address some of the questions about patients that have been on gene therapy or where you may be after gene therapy is approved? Yeah, I, I we talk about this almost every day, I would say. We've already talked about it today. They um, And so it is something that we see on top of gene therapy. So it is something we're trying to figure out what the best time for going into a clinical trial there is. Uh, because if gene therapy is moving kids more towards Becker, then yes, we should be able to, to have that additional benefit uh, in patients with, with gene therapy. So on top of that, um, and of course we are measure, we are looking at this on top of steroids in Duchenne, but in Becker, we're not looking at it on top of steroids. So we get both of those uh, pieces of information from this kind this development program that goes across the whole spectrum um, of of Duchenne Becker. Yeah, you actually anticipated where I was going to go with my question because I know in the Becker population, there was little steroid of no steroid use. And mm -hmm. have you any sense that you might want to actually look at it in steroid naive young Duchenne patients? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Uh, I, that's a, a stepwise approach. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we are also thinking about younger boys, two and three year olds. How do yeah. we how do we look at them? What are the kinds of endpoints that we use? How do we draw blood in them? I mean, so all of this is that are these are things that we're thinking about in the, the development uh, program. We would love to do everything all at once, mm -hmm. and we've got um, yes, we've got three trials going now, and we are uh, are looking to expand sir. Yeah, so to answer actually, some of those very important questions. Yeah, look, talking, I, I, I'd like to expand a little bit upon it because once again, you anticipated where I was going to go with my thinking. You know, I view this as both a standalone therapy and its ability to protect and, and mm -hmm. stop muscle from cells from dying, as well as a combination therapy. And 
I think we really need to be in younger and younger patients. And so like putting it in, in a, a conversation right now about where would we be, you know, where would you see the ideal point to start? Is this in a child that's just diagnosed? Is this in six months old? Really preventing disease, you know, from the very beginning. I think we're once going to see yeah. the, the most impact. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as all of you probably know, with newborn screening, what are we measuring? We're measuring CK. And so that's telling us that there is muscle damage in infancy. And more and more information is coming out about um, kind of the subtle uh, changes in, in, in milestones, in meeting milestones. So it does feel, you know, the younger, the better. Um, to be able, especially if there is something that we can intervene with safely and long term. So that is. Well, the I would say, don't lose heart if uh, if you're older. You know, like I think the Becker data that we have to date suggests that even you know uh, fairly old folks with low function actually are, are benefiting from the compound. So if you have some muscle to protect. Five over six can potentially protect your muscle. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Alan. I was actually just going to go there. You're really looking at the older population, you know, that looks through a different lens, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, what what are the plans for looking at uh, what what is the timing? I should say, really, for looking at non-ambulant patients. Yeah, I, I think what we need to find out is what the appropriate dose is and how much drug we need in the bloodstream, and then that will allow us to move to other other groups. As as Alan mentioned. Um, the uh, folks that have Becker who were in the, the study have, you know, we look at, at, at um, you know, we can figure out kind of from their function how much muscle fat they have with, you know, that you would see on MRI. And we'll be looking at that in the phase two study. And they have as much uh, uh, as boys who are in their, the non-ambulatory phase. So that's, that's actually encouraging for us to know that we've already looked at safety uh, in that population. So. Super. I, I just want to confirm, it, it, this is mutation agnostic, just to make sure everyone actually hears that there. Yes. So the study is in, is in boys just four to, to nine, but there are no mutation exclusions uh, in the study. Yeah. Um, I understand that there's a single clinical center recruiting right now, Joanne. Is, have you plans to expand upon that? So there is one center that is open on clintrials.gov, and we will have around a dozen sites or, or more in the United States for Thank this. I, I actually checked this morning before the call just to see if any more had opened, but as soon as they do, you know, we'll certainly yeah. put that information out as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions from the community? Like I feel that I've covered most of what I wanted to grab a hold of. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked about the troponin level, whether that was cardiac troponin, because we hear a lot about cardiac. And this, there are, so troponin is a protein in muscle cells. And there are different kinds of troponin that are from the heart, which gets measured uh, in the clinic. And this is skeletal muscle uh, troponin. So it's actually different. We can distinguish the different kinds of fibers and where the troponin is coming from. So where the muscle damage is. Yeah. And so the answer is no, it's not cardiac. There was, a, there was a great question that just came in around muscle growth. Um, and that's a super interesting question as well, right? Is the compound gonna stop normal muscle growth? And uh, in order to address that, what we actually did is we took, um, mice and we actually used a snake venom called cardiotoxin from the pipe from uh, from cobra weirdly enough to actually cause muscle breakdown so you can actually inject this it causes the full muscle to break down and then what we did is we examined how does that muscle grow back if there's a load of compound present and the muscles grew back just fine mm -hmm. so modulating this contraction has no effect at all on muscle growth actually i would hope to see with prolonged dosing and we're seeing some hints of this in becca that overall muscle health improves with time right because you've changed the relationship between exercising and injury so you should have more healthy muscles we shall see mm -hmm. yeah and john one other one that, that i was curious by this I, i'm not familiar with the tasso m20 um one patient was asking about any pain associated with that is the use of lidocaine yeah. or even recommended yeah. 
I can personally say that it doesn't hurt. Um, okay. And other folks have, have tried it. You know, that's why they, they use like the insulin uh, or the, the, the glucometers that continuously measure glucose. They're used on the upper arm or someplace that just doesn't have very many nerve fibers, under, unlike the, the fingertips. So I can't say that it doesn't hurt, but um, it, it, we, everything that we have heard from folks is that it is, um, it is not painful. But and, and we will explore. We'll um, we need to ask them about the lidocaine because that has come up. Can we use that just in case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. unless you guys have got any other things to say, I, I'm pretty was, much there. I was going to say something about like the how do we get into different groups of of patient, different ages and and stages. And one thing people may not know is that the regulators like the FDA and their colleagues in Europe, the EMA, actually ask us to lay that out. That's part of the regulatory, some of the stuff that we have to give them. We have to lay out to them, how are we going to treat different ages uh, in over the, the pediatric age range? So that's part of something that we're required to do as, as part of that. They're very interested and want them, uh, want us to make sure we've thought of that. Oh, we had a late question about dosing based on weight or not. The answer is no, we've got flat dosing. Uh, this compound appears to be quite safe over a large dosing range in Becker. So, so that gives us some luxury there to not worry too much about that. Um, there were some questions about um, if the CK is reduced immediately after the taking of the compound, does that does that mean degeneration is slow? Yes, it does. If the compound's there, it's doing its thing. If the compound's not there, it's not doing its thing. This is very different from some of the genetic fixes that we've been talking about as drug developers for forever, right? You have to keep taking the medicine and if you keep taking it, it's gonna keep protecting your muscles. Super, what I would do is um, we could keep an on on this, but I think that we'll look at some of these questions and answer them as they come up over the next days, uh, just deal with it that way. Um, I think for me, I, like, I've got an enormous amount of gratitude for the team at Edgewise. I think this is a really novel approach to treat this disease. And sessions like this really get the community not only engaged, but really informed about the importance of this type of mechanism and how it can actually impact the disease. And I truly look forward, you know, over the next many months as you recruit the Duchenne trial, really learning how that their data is translating from Becker into Duchenne and then expanding it into another population. So with that, you know, I'd say nothing more than thank you guys and wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you for that chance to speak. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Edgewise team. And to those um, who still have questions, again, it's cares at cureduchenne.org. If it's a question that, you know, only Edgewise can answer, I will get in touch with the team there and make sure we get you an appropriate response. And then I also wanted to just lastly mention that um, Mike and I and the rest of the team, we often have one-to-one -one calls with families um, so I see some of these questions that are pretty specific to um, the decisions you might need to make, your family specific situation. Some people are asking even about genetic mutation. We're here for you. Um, we do these calls all the time and we find that they're really helpful to families to, to gain some confidence in the decisions that they're going to make. So you can reach out to me. It's my first name, Kerry at curedushen.org or our general email cares at curedushen.org. And we're always here for you. And thanks again to the Edgewise team. This was um, a really informative and, and great webinar. Appreciate it.